welcome to another episode of Pit Lane Parlay. Welcome to another episode of Pit Lane Parlay. My name is host Mike Jokum. Our buddy George is helping me out today as well as special guest Ryan Eversley as we go through everything balance of performance. And for a short little intro, I will give it over to George. Hey guys, and thanks Ryan for coming on. Uh, For anyone who's either unfamiliar with sports cars or doesn't like quality motorsport content or has been living under a rock, Ryan's a well-established Honda factory driver who's running a number series, as well as one of the hosts of the wonderful Dinner with Racers podcast and now Amazon Prime show. With that, let's talk about BOP, and before that, let's uh, let's talk about the first race of the season a little bit, since it is next week after all. Now, Ryan, you're running the uh, Honda Type R TCR again, but this year with a new team and new teammate. How are you feeling going into the season opener? Yeah, it's going to be a, a new experience for me. Uh, just thanks again for having me on, and uh, anybody doing a podcast about racing, I, I think that's completely jumped the shark, and it's a totally horrible idea, so... Good luck with it. No, um, hey. you know it's that's <laughs> going to be a fun year. I've got a really young teammate, uh, Taylor Hagler from Texas, and she's been doing a really great job in a several different categories of touring car style of racing. And last year in the uh, former series, now called SRO America, she had a couple of podiums. She got a pole position at Watkins Glen, which is one of the fastest places we go. So she's definitely not scared, and uh, I think. Uh, she and I working together will be pretty neat because I haven't had a, a younger teammate in a while. The last few years I raced for the Hart race team, which is like kind of a factory based touring car program from the Ohio Honda factory. And my teammate, Chad Gilsinger is one of the fastest, what we call gentleman drivers probably on the planet because his full-time job is a Honda engineer. He works every day and then gets to race on the side as a benefit of, of being part of the Hart program. But Chad's very self-sufficient. He looks at his own data he does his own setup. He works on the car. He doesn't need me to handhold or like train him. He's been doing it for so long. Whereas Taylor, still very new, 24 years old. And uh, I'm going to be doing a lot more hands-on coaching with her than I have in the last couple of years. And the team we've uh, signed with is the LA Honda World program, which uh, almost won the championship last year. And they're based in Indianapolis by a company or a racing called LAP Motorsports, which formerly ran the mini factory program in the ST category. So they've won a ton of races. A lot of their crew guys are IndyCar engineers and mechanics that do the 500 every year when there's like a third or fourth entrant for some of these full-time teams and they need extra crew. So the team is really, really switched on. Taylor and I are probably the unknown factor going into it because we haven't worked together that long and she is a rookie in IMSA. So it's going to be a challenging, but I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about the season. Awesome. Thanks, man. Well, I'll throw it back over to Mike. Uh, sorry, sorry, we're talking over each other there a little bit. Uh, throw it back <laughs> over to Mike to discuss one of the two uh, most controversial topics in sports cars, that is BOP. Yeah, uh, this is something I'm still trying to wrap my head around more so in the past year than ever. But Ryan, in, in general, if somebody were to come to you and say, what is balance of performance? How are you going to explain it to them? Okay, so first and foremost, I need to mention that IMSA, which is the sanctioning body that I I race in uh, full-time in the TCR car, put out a bulletin last year saying that any public discussions about BOP could be met with uh, penalties and fines of some sort. So I have to be very careful about how I word what I say. However, I don't disagree with the balance of performance idea. Basically what it is, is they're trying to stop somebody from being an overdog or having a unfair advantage and they literally will change the performance of your car by ad- adding weight, taking power away, maybe changing the ride height and, and suspension characteristics of the vehicle. And the name of the game basically being, if let's say Honda builds this awesome Type R Civic and it wins nine races out of 10, well, that's going to limit the people that have the Audis and, and uh, Alphas interest in participating. So in theory, they're trying to make it a fair or even playing field. So everyone has a shot. And so it's not a bad idea. And it's been around for a lot longer than people realize. But it also causes quite a bit of vitriol when fans of certain brands don't see their car getting the results they think they deserve. 
And then that's where it becomes kind of a, a hot button issue. Awesome. I appreciate that. So I know, you know, IMSA versus some of the other sports car series around the world has a different take on, on BOP. What makes IMSA different than some of the other, you know, BOPs around the world? Um, well, if you look at IMSA, they're owned by NASCAR. So NASCAR has some of the, I mean, in this country, the most technologically advanced resources at their disposal because the budgets are there and they need it to do the things they do for, for the stock car series. So if you look at their resources available to them, they have quite a lot of staff. They have quite a lot of engineering background. And what IMSA has tried to do is utilize the data that's given to them by the teams by having the teams carry data loggers. Obviously, there's timing loops at all the racetracks. They, they use, utilize all the technology they can, including like our engine data from the MoTeC systems that like the race car runs and things like that. That works if nobody is up to no good. And a lot of times people are, are up to no good. So in racing, so weird. Uh, <laughs> so basically, like we go to Daytona and everybody drives around and goes as fast as they possibly can. And then they look at it, and if there's one car that's clearly dominant after that event, they'll say, hey, we need to adjust this a little bit for the next race. And it's an extremely difficult job, and it's extremely thankless because no one, no one ever thanks the, the series when they win a race. Oh, man, thanks, for, thanks to him, so we got great VOP. We were able to win by a mile. That was awesome. That never happened. So it's just one of these things that they take in as much data as possible. If you have to look at it, there's – something like 50 cars in the Michelin Pilot Challenge Series, which I'll be in, plus 38 cars in the Rolex 24 Hours of Daytona next week. So, you know, you're getting up there towards 100 cars of data that needs to be looked through to see what's what. And it's not easy, and you have a small amount of time to do it. So they generally, I think, get it pretty damn close, IMSA especially. There are some series that get it way wrong, and you're like, how did you even get to this decision? But I think some of the some of the things that we see are, especially in the early years of, of me having racing that was based around BOP, some of the decisions that were being made weren't necessarily because the car was faster, but the team was better. So I worked with a team in 2010 uh, through 2014 that had one of the best engineers I've ever worked with, had some of the best strategy, and we had amazing starting drivers where a lot of the other cars had drivers that were quite a bit off the pace. So we were constantly getting good results, and it's because we had like the total package. And then the next season – uh, the car we were racing got like a hundred pounds of weight added to it. And you're thinking, well, well, well hang, hang on a second. It's not that we were the fastest car. We literally just had the best program. And so that that's where a lot of people involved can get pretty upset because you're like, Oh, okay. You know, what's the deal. So whereas in the past we had BOP adjustments several times throughout the year. Now it's literally in between events. And in some series, not IMSA necessarily, but in some series, they do on weekend BOP changes. And I think that's a little bit much. Wow. Yeah, that's, uh, that seems like a lot to worry about within a short period of time. I don't know how yeah. much you're able to... Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, what I was going to say is when I'm explaining balance of performance to somebody that doesn't know anything about racing, they immediately turn their nose up at it. And again, I completely understand the reason we're doing it we don't like formula one for example i it's awesome to watch because the pinnacle of motorsports and technology is amazing but when ferrari dominated everybody hated it and now that mercedes is dominating everybody hates that they're dominating because you know it's like kind of pre predetermined who's going to win and that's the idea behind bop to stop that from happening but eventually you can get too involved and then that makes it a problem so what i tell people that don't race especially when they don't get it and i'm explaining it from a negative side that i don't necessarily think it needs to be the way it is is that imagine if you showed up to run a foot race for the Olympics and it's you versus Michael Johnson, you know, one of the fastest guys on the planet and you willingly signed up knowing that you're going to race against Michael Johnson and Michael Johnson does everything he needs to do to get up to speed and, and be the fast guy ever. And you get there and they're like, but the organizers go, well, hang on a second. This isn't fair. Even though you signed up knowing what it was and they put a weight vest on Michael Johnson, you'd go, whoa, whoa, hang, hang on a second. You know, so imagine we're watching the Olympics next summer and, you know, Usain Bolt or whoever goes to run and they're like, well, he's too good. He wins all the time, even though he's just naturally more talented. Let's go ahead and put a weight vest on him. You would, you would see outroar, you know what I mean? Uproar and, and outrage. So that's where it's kind of hard for people to understand. So what I often refer back to is that I think maybe the rule book needs to be a bit better to stop the big outliers you know where a car shows up and it's extremely dominant and you're like well geez 
because the manufacturer is building to the rule book. So if the rule book is tightened up quite a bit, like in NASCAR, they're not allowed to have very much difference between the cars, but the racing is extremely close. So I think a lot of things could be better if the rule book was a lot tighter. So there's two sides to it. I understand the need for it, but I think it could be a little bit cleaner if we started out with a much, you know, more limited things that could be done to the cars. That's fair. I definitely, uh, definitely understand both sides there. Uh, one thing that, that I read, and I don't know how much you can really talk about it, but I will, I will ask anyway, was that it, IMSA was trying to prevent much more this year in terms of teams sandbagging, uh, especially at the roar. Does the BOP help or, or hurt those who are, are trying to sandbag? And do you think IMSA's effort to curtail sand, sandbagging has worked so far? It, I mean, I can't speak on other people's behalf because I don't know what they're up to, but I, I just as a racer that's been in the paddock. So in my test at, 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 the, at the Roar, I felt like everybody in the TCR class was going for it. But it's really interesting when you have multiple teams that have the same kind of car, you can't control the other people and what they're doing. And the ego of a racer will always show up. If I have the chance to go be P1 in a class, even though my manufacturer doesn't want me to, it's really hard to go, yeah. I might not have a job next year and I'll need to tell people that I was P1 at the Roar and you might not hire me at that point. What am I, you know? So it's one of those things where you have to be kind of like a driver's always going to be selfish about their own results, but you don't want to hurt, bite the hand that feeds you. So in the TCR class at the Roar, I felt like everybody was going really fast, but then you'd see, you'd see cars from one manufacturer that were P1 with drivers I've never heard of. And you're like, oh, that car must be pretty fast. And then you'd see the car, like the pro car for that team that has the best drivers in it are like at the bottom of the time sheets and they're driving a lot. So you're like, eh, okay. But there's always a way to hide speed, no matter what. There's always a way. You can run full tanks full of fuel. You can raise the ride height up. You can work on fuel mile. You know, like there's always certain things. And, and I feel like the series has done a really good job of keeping an eye on that. And they've even put in a basically a penalty in the in the rule book that says if they they think you're up to no good, you will get a five minute in race penalty. So there is there is a chance you get you know you screw yourself. It's just one of those things that I've said that I think a thousand times. That's just one of those things. It's really hard for both sides because it's the series versus the teams and vice versa. And you can play ball and be the good team that you know, gave him some what they wanted, and then they still might not help you. You know, your car still not, might not be the fastest thing ever. So it's kind of a it's kind of a chess game. And if you look at the teams that are super competitive, even when the BOP is not in their favor, they still get pretty strong results because they're executing on pit stops, driver changes, strategy with the fuel, uh, being good in traffic, having the best driver lineup, you know, because you can have the fastest car in the world, but if you have a gentleman driver that's off the pace, then, you know, it might not matter in the end. So... If, if you look at the history of the sport, especially since this BOP stuff has come up, there are certain teams that have been handed big BOP penalties and it's because they're so successful. And then they still finish in the top three of the championship. Yeah. One thing you, you mentioned there that I'm curious about. So if, if you, you know, sandbag during the roar and you get a five minute penalty, that penalty is during the, you know, either your race on Friday or the 24 hour race on Saturday. So it's not a penalty during the roar. It's actually during the race. Yeah, exactly. Like they, they sent, teams home in the past from from the roar if they felt like they were up to no good or they parked them for an entire session uh, i think one team at the roar in the gtd class was actually having some sort of turbo issues and i talked to one of the drivers about it and he's like no we absolutely were like couldn't figure out what was wrong with our car no one could the manufacturer no one knew and imsa looked at it and went no oh, you guys are up to no good and they were like no seriously we <laughs> we're not sure what's wrong with the car we're trying to fix it and i think they were like the only one in their class of that car so it kind of so you can go to your teammate, but like, hey, look at your data and compare. Um, yeah, I'll, so the, I'll quickly jump in and say yeah. that uh, there were uh, two GTD uh, entries, both running single car or single makes in their class that got parked for a little bit. So, yeah, talking to it, I don't know how much of it was an issue with the other car that didn't necessarily admit it on social media. But uh, it's it's that's an interesting point that even if you're not purposely or – uh, actually sandbagging, you might get, you know, get the IMSA down on you anyways. Yeah, for sure. And if, I guess the reality is that the cream always rises to the top in this sport. You, you know, the smartest people are always doing things. 
but we did see that five minute penalty show up a couple of years ago at the 24 hour and it wasn't for actual on track pace it was for pit stop pace they had assumed a of the audi team's land i think it was had this crazy fast fueling pit stop strategy that they figured out and uh it was found that they were out of line with what they had shown for performance at the roar so essentially now they're getting this five minute penalty in the race and they were the car to beat you know so it, it's a pretty steep penalty comeback room yeah makes sense there uh before we move on real quick is there anything else bop related you think is uh useful for people listening out there uh i think the biggest thing is that it's it's for fans especially i i read all the facebook posts and forums and everything for fans you have to remember that there is no outright benefit for them for the series if one brand wins all the races so when let for example say corvette wins five races in a row and you read how all the Porsche guys are, this is crap. This is, you know, IMS is helping them and blah, blah. It's like, it's not like that. that. That's so naive to think that the series would want to alienate one of their biggest partners publicly and do it in such a, you know, obvious way. So if you're watching, we've all made like internally in the sport, we've all made our peace with what this is because it's probably not going away anytime soon, but it's become such a public thing that my, my personal thing I would do is I would stop making the, BOP changes public. Like there's no need for the fans to know all these internal things when this when the series knows or when the when the teams know. And you can talk about it a bit, but they've it's become such a big topic that it's in front of the show itself. And instead of watching these awesome cars drive around that you're like, oh that's amazing. Our fans are super smart. And they're watching going, well if they didn't add that 10 kilos of weight or take away that gallon of fuel, they could have finished the lap ahead. And you're like, that's not what this is supposed to be. The fans are supposed to be enjoying these amazing cars and drivers battling each other. So I think removing it from a public point of view of like, Hey, this is what we did this weekend would probably calm down the, the, uh, vitriol a bit. Yeah. I, I, I've started reading the comments the other day after the BOP came out and, uh, I didn't feel as smart as I usually do because there were some people in there with some, uh, extremely smart takes. And obviously, you know, you get some uh, keyboard warriors mixed in there, but yeah, very, very interesting. It uh, definitely helps me understand a uh, driver's perspective. Uh, it's pretty, pretty cool to understand it. So I know George wanted to jump in with a BMW endurance challenge question next. Uh, not so much a question as a plug for the race. That's what uh, Ryan will be driving in on Friday. I think I got the name right. It's always kind of a, a word jumble with those races. Uh, and I won't call it by that tire manufacturer's name because we know <laughs> you're, a, uh, you're a continental guy. And uh, that's what I got on no, my no. car. No, that's okay. Michelin deserves love. They are supporting our sport and they are providing a a lot of financial backing to keep our show on the road. You know what I mean? So as I'm a continental guy, everybody knows I'm a continental guy, but Michelin is our series sponsor and they deserve some love for that. Yeah, right on. Well, in that case, it's the uh, Michelin pilot challenge that you'll be running in. It's a four hour enduro. Check it out Friday. I think I don't remember offhand what time it goes green, but it's about midday. So if you're having a slow day at the office, definitely tune in. It's always a great race that's long enough for a lot of different strategy calls, but short enough where you can keep your attention on it the whole time. So with that, uh, Ryan, do you want to plug uh, the work you do for QNF and uh, Cupids? Yeah, sure. I, uh, for the last uh, couple of years, um, started actually at the Daytona 24 hour in 2010 or 11, I, they're all blurring together these years, but I, I got an opportunity to race a Porsche at Daytona and on the car was this charity called the Children's Sewer Foundation. And I had never heard of it. In fact, I thought when I saw the car for the first time that the charity was for autism because they had a, a logo similar to, to, you know, to the autistic foundation with the puzzle pieces. And uh, when I met these families and started learning about what neurofibromatosis is, which I had never heard of it, I was shocked to learn that one in 3,000 kids are being born with it, and it's a genetic tumor disease that, you know, can cause a lifelong, a life of of pain, and it can also be fatal, and it was really eye-opening to see these kids that were so excited to see a race car go around and have their names on it, and so after that weekend, I was really, like, I need to do something to be a part of this to spread the word, because I'd never heard of it, and it sounds really bad, and as a kid, I had spinal meningitis when I was two years old and I lost the hearing in my left ear. I spent about a year in and out of Scottish Rites Children's Hospital in Atlanta. And it was like, okay, I'm a, I'm a survivor of a really, you know, bad disease. Let me help, uh, let me help someone else with theirs. So 
started doing as much as I could with the Children's Tumor Foundation. That led me to the Cupid's Undy Run, which is basically every February, the creators of this charity, Chad Leathers, who's a buddy of mine through, through the Children's Tumor Foundation, he created this charity with his friends to help his brother, Drew Leathers. Drew is no longer with us because he succumbed to the illness, um, but Drew became a friend of mine as well. And basically it's a fun run. It's not even about the run, it's about raising money. And what they've done is they've created this charity where you run for about a mile in the city streets of whatever city your event's taking place in your underwear, literally in your underwear in the middle of winter, it's freezing cold and disgusting. And you get people to raise money for you. And so for the last uh, six years, I think I've raised $175,000 and it's been through my fan base, like through followers and racing and competitors of mine and teammates of mine have donated and taken on the cause. Andy Lally and Spencer from Pelly and Spencer's wife, Lindsay, everybody jumps in on it in Atlanta and kind of supports it, raises their money. So it's been an incredible thing. And I can't thank the fans for supporting it enough. I run for Kieran F with Jack Atlanta, young man I met in 2010. He's about to be 15. I can't believe it. But his family, Jack Burke, and his dad, Jake Burke, had become like my family. And uh, Jake has, sorry, Jack has NF and has been through a lot of chemo and, and different treatments to, to help have a healthy life. And it's been a real tough road. But through my racing and, and Cupid's thing, being able to raise $175,000 and, and ongoing, I've currently got a link on my Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. You can look it up and uh, donate or just spread the word. That would be a, a big thing for me. I'm really serious about it. Yeah, thanks for talking about that, Ryan. Um, glad, uh, glad for all you do, and you know, hope you make that uh, huge number again this year. I think you were what P one in the country last year in fundraising. Yeah, it's it's an interesting thing. You know, <laughs> you get competitive as a racer, so you want to win. You know, with the donations, and uh, I've been P one overall a couple of years, and and a couple of wealthy individuals have done donation matching so basically they'll start at 25 grand and say like every penny you put in i'll match it you know to 25 grand so i end up raising 50 or whatever and that's cool because it's all going in the same pot but to be able to raise 20 something i think one year we raised like twenty four thousand dollars in one one go and that was crazy but at the end it all goes in the same pot it all goes towards helping the children's tumor foundation and fighting against this disease neurofibromatosis and schwannomonotosis and yeah, it's been really cool. The, like, again, the fans and the ones that made this happen, I actually had a lady once that said, well, it's not fair. We don't have a racing fan base. And I was like, well, I'm glad I do, <laughs> you know, to, to raise all this money. So, but it's been really cool. And I, again, I can't do any, I can't do the podcast without the fans. Sean and I wouldn't have the success we have and I wouldn't be able to raise the money that I've been able to raise without them. So it's been all about them. Awesome. Thanks, man. And uh, I'll say IMSA and IMSA drivers in particular in the fan base, in my experience, are super passionate about various charities. Uh, Ryan, thanks for uh, for talking about that. And I'll say it's really awesome, especially in IMSA, between the drivers, fans, whomever, that uh, you can leverage the natural competitiveness and such caring people and passionate fans to really make a difference in the world. So thank you for that. And thanks again for coming on. Is there anything else you want to plug uh, before we close out? Uh, well, yeah, we... Yeah, we just launched our Amazon Prime TV show. It's the same name as the podcast, Dinner with Racers. Very easy to find. And uh, we've got six episodes that are going to be, you know, five of them are already available. The sixth one's going up very soon. And we plan on continuing doing that. And it's very much in line with our podcast where we like to have a lot of fun and joke around, but also uncover some serious parts of the sport. And uh, again, like our fans have been nuts about supporting the TV show or the podcast. Now the TV show has taken on a life of its own, but you mentioned Continental Tire earlier. Couldn't do this without them and Acura supporting us. So it's been crazy. And you guys are starting your show and you have no idea where it could go because we literally, when we started DWR, Sean, my partner, Sean Hackman was very smart about leveling, ex measuring expectations saying, Hey, look, you know, this could go nowhere. You know, I know we're excited, but this could just be a flop. And here we are six years later, millions and millions of downloads. We've sold a ton of shirts and hats and all sorts of crap. And, and we were able to pull off a, a season of, of TV, which, you know, if you'd asked me day one, if we thought that was going to happen, I would agree. And we've got people like celebrities in our sport telling us how much they love the show and how, how great they think it is. And it's just been incredible. So I guess anybody that's listening, if there's something like that you're passionate about, 
go for it. You know, like I, I can't believe we have a TV show. It's, in the, it's, it's insane to me. So yeah. Thanks for the fans to support that. Obviously our sponsors are a big, important part of it, but I met Dale Jr. earlier this year and he first thing out of his mouth and I didn't assume he knew anything about me. He goes, Hey, I love your show. And I was like, wow, this guy literally knows everybody in the world <laughs> and takes the time to listen to our stuff. We, that's pretty crazy. So stick with what you guys are doing and you never know what's going to happen with it. Awesome. Thanks, man. And uh, I have to say, I'm going to do my best to find an original Tim Richmond poster. It'll confuse the wife greatly, but I uh, hope to have that found and bought and framed up one day. <laughs> yeah. The funny thing, we didn't really tell the story of how we got into that poster, but basically we were doing an Alan Kowicki documentary uh, in Charlotte a couple of years ago. And I saw the poster on the wall and I knew about the poster because uh, Andy Lally was in the Goodyear version of it, which is a more current one. And so I, I showed Sean the legend of the of the poster, and he had no clue. And I thought, well, if Sean doesn't know about it, and he's in racing pretty heavily, we gotta we gotta find out more about this, tell the story. So that's one of our episodes that's on on Amazon Prime, and it's a lot of fun. <laughs> right on, thanks, man. Uh, Mike, do you want to close this out? Yeah, Ryan, thanks very much for all the info and and everything, and and your time today. Uh, putting this together last minute. I appreciate it. I will share your charity links in our in our show notes and on the social medias over the next uh, couple of days here, especially leading up to the Rolex. But again, just wanted to thank you for your time and and uh, everybody listening. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you learned a little bit. And uh, we'll, we'll be back with another IMSA recording in the near future. Thanks a lot, guys. I appreciate having me on. Yeah, no problem, man. Thank you. 